Welcome to Le Rendez-vous. My name is Garance Doré and I'm a writer with so many stories to tell and ideas to share that I created this special moment to talk about all the things that are going on in our lives. So come, let's spend a moment together. Le Rendez-vous is brought to you by Doré, the skincare line I co-created, wanting to bring more simplicity and efficacy to our lives. Check out the end of the episode for a special code just for you, the Rendezvous listeners. There is a subject that I've been asked many times to talk about. Actually, there are a few of those, and I'm just taking my time with them. But one of them comes more often than others, and it is the subject of depression. And I took my time to come to it because I've been observing very carefully what's happening in the field of mental health and pop psychology and the way we banalize those, I don't know if it's a word in English, but the way that we make those things so normal. And I think in so many ways it's fantastic, but in many others it kind of glamorizes and promotes these things to the point where people who haven't experienced a depression might think that there is something wrong with them. And that's what I don't want to participate in. I think that it is better to never experience it. I think it is lovely to have a very stable mental health. And as much as I learned from my depression, And that's what I'm going to talk about today. I think that I could have learned these lessons without putting myself through what I did put myself through. Of course, because I'm going to talk about depression, I just want you to make sure that you're in the mood to listen to something like that. It's not that it's going to be depressing. It's just that some things you might recognize in yourself. And it's just always good to have a lot of distance and to understand that what I'm going to share is just my personal experience. That I'm not a therapist, that I'm certainly not a psychiatrist, and that I definitely don't want to make the fact that I had a depression one day a part of how I'm defined or who I am. And that's something that I've always been very careful about. I've touched upon subjects that are deep and difficult, such as infertility, even breakups and mental health stories, but I never wanted them to define me because that's not how I feel about myself. They were moments of my life and they're gone and I'm happy they are. And these are the things that I've learned from them. So depression is not a funny subject. With all that said, I'm going to describe to you the first time that I've encountered this dark moment in my life. The first time I was 17 years old, the background was a very broken family, loving parents, but young and completely lost, and me not knowing who I was, and coming back from studying abroad for a year when I was 16, surrounded by my best friends and having a fantastic year where I didn't work at all at school, so I thought, okay, in order to have my baccalauréat, which is the last year of high school in France, I'd better go back to my mom's and just keep myself there and study. The result of this great idea was that the vibe at home had changed and it felt really difficult to me. And that year was incredibly difficult. And by the time spring came, I just think I couldn't take it anymore. I had started listening to very depressing music. I was spending a lot of time alone because I hadn't been able to make new friends as I had just come back to a new school. I hated everything around me. And I think the signs when I think about it now were here Life felt gray, and that to me has always been a sign. I felt bored, I didn't feel excited, I didn't feel inspired. And I started having some weird obsessions. I'm just going to share one with you now, because 
maybe you're feeling things like that and you don't know what to make of them. And that's a pattern that I saw when I experienced my second depression when I was much older a few years ago. And one of the things was that I started developing obsessions around food. So for example, I started developing an obsession about white. So I wanted to wear only white and eat only white stuff. And that might seem quite funny to hear it. And that's why I want to share it because it's a bit shameful. But looking back now, what it tells me is that my mental health was in pain. It was suffering. And so my brain was trying to come up with any type of idea to take me out of the gray zone where I had landed, which looked a little bit like the upside down, you know, in Stranger Things, where it's the same world, but nothing grasps your attention. There is nothing that you want, nothing that you need. It's just this kind of heaviness. And major trigger warning there, and I don't even know if I should talk about that, It's actually, that's the reason why I've never wanted to broach these subjects online. But let's just say I had terrible thoughts at some point. And then I try to put them into action. And my mom realized that. And she took me straight to a doctor. And of course, I didn't understand anything about what was going on in my life, in my body, with my hormones, with my mental health, how I had gotten myself to there. I don't remember if I was sleeping at night, who I was in love with, what what was going on at this moment. Just remember this very, very kind of hardcore, depressing type of music that I was listening to and how messy my bedroom was and what a, basically like what a mess I was. And I went to that doctor and he talked to me very simply. And he said that what was happening to me was very simple, that it was a chemical imbalance in my brain and that there is solutions for that. And that one of them is to take antidepressants. So we came back with my mom at home and we had a conversation. And I told her that I didn't want to scare her, which I think is an absolute lie. I think that what I had shown her was absolutely to scare her. And it was because I needed care and I didn't feel loved and I didn't feel surrounded because there was so much drama going on in my house. And I think what a lot of this was, was just look at me, please look at me. And I had a conversation with my mother. I think it had softened her. She wasn't really easy at that time. She was young and lost. And we decided that I would wait and not take the antidepressants right away, but instead try to put myself back on a path towards mental health. And I don't know exactly what was the plan. I actually don't really think there was one. But basically, I think we both thought that I had scared myself enough that probably would kick me out of my depression. Very simplistic thinking. I don't even remember going to a therapist at that time, but it makes sense because this was spring. And I remember that I was going to spend my summer working in a place where there was no therapist. And then... I was going to go study um, in Aix-en-Provence, so I would leave Corsica. So it was almost impossible to plan seeing a therapist. And this is why I didn't really recover right away. And I'm telling you that story because it's super interesting. So I don't know how long it took, but I think it took maybe one, two, three weeks. I was feeling better in the sense that I wanted to feel better meaning that I think that before I had this moment of despair that my mom found me in, I was cultivating depression. I was cultivating this darkness. I was exploring it unknowingly. I think there was something cool for me in expressing this sadness, this darkness. I think it's something that a lot of teenagers at some point explore, but maybe I was more fragile and 
and maybe the situation that I was around was more complicated and and I just slipped into that depression. But after this moment of acting out by depression, if you will, I actually wanted to be better. I was trying to cultivate positivity again and find again who I had been. I wasn't this person that was so attracted to negativity and dark songs and depressing novels and all. I try to find back the sporty, fun, excited about life type of person that I was, but I was really struggling. And I felt very alone and unsupported. And this is how one day my mother found me. And it's so funny because that's how much I think as a teenager, I was acting out all these things because if I had wanted, my mom would never have found me in those two instances where I was showing off how terrible I was feeling. So that second time she found me with my hand in the cupboard as I was going to take the antidepressants because I hadn't been able to feel much better and I was still feeling this grayness even though I was trying to kick myself out of whatever this was. I don't even think at that time I had called it really a depression. I had decided, well, okay, well, the doctor told me there was a solution, so why wouldn't I do it? And you can think whatever you want about what my mother did when she found me with the antidepressants in my hand. But the funny thing is that it worked. And basically what she did is to tell me, just stop. Just stop this. Stop wallowing in your misery. Go out. Go have fun with your friends. Go work. Get yourself out of your bedroom. I don't want to hear about it. You're too young to take this medicine. You have everything to be happy. Just get out of here. She kicked my ass. And that day, I remember she kicked me out of my depression. And I know this sounds crazy, but it was one of the most fantastic kick in the ass I've ever received. And it worked. It worked. I then finished school. I went on to work all that summer. I probably fell in love, which is my pattern, you know. And, and then went to university. And I still had to deal with stuff after that. But the fog and the grayness and the darkness of the depression had been lifted that day. I think I needed... I needed it. I needed someone to say, stop listening to yourself. Just get out. Stop thinking about yourself. And look, it's not about telling you if you're going through this to do that. I'm just telling my story. I think some things work for some people. My mother and I are very connected for better or worse. And I think in some place she felt like that was what I needed. The irony is that um, maybe 20 years later, she would become a therapist herself. That's her profession now. So she already had a sense of these things. And also this is interesting because I think her fear of medicine is something that has been ingrained inside of me for forever. And that will play a huge role in my life in the future. Gosh, this is going to be a long episode. I realized I just started talking to you about the first depression, which was basically just a blip because it was quite short-lived. I think it was about six months of my life and that I kicked it out quite easily at the end of the day. Anyway, let's move on. So I thought I'd tell that first story because, yeah, it's just a, just a different approach to depression and uh, sometimes a bit of tough love can help people like me. My second depression came in a fundamentally different background. It would take too long to explain all the ramification of what had led me to the place where I realized I wasn't feeling so good. But I'm going to recap. So number one, I was getting to the end of a huge cycle of success and crazy life in New York and making a ton of money, which I never had planned for myself and not really knowing how to deal with that, but also realizing that the place where I had had all my success wasn't for me and was making me quite miserable. 
So there was the mourning of that and the fear of what would come later, because what was I going to do with my life? And I had tried to push myself for too many years into continuing on that path because I thought, well, I found something that works for me. I can't let it go. So that's one thing. The other thing was that I was on a depressing fertility journey. Uh, that in itself is a long podcast in the future. The third thing is I was in a terrible relationship, which is not anybody's fault, really. It was just wrong match, wrong choice. And it stemmed, I think, from the fact that I wasn't really emotionally healthy after all these years in New York, working my ass off and not really knowing who I was at the end of it. So I chose someone that wasn't right for me. The other thing was that I had health issues, probably exacerbated by the treatments I was taking at that time. So see, there was kind of a, a whole fabric of things that kind of melded together to create this grayness around me. I was dealing with huge sugar imbalance because food and specifically sugar had been one of the ways that I was basically medicating myself. I had a lot of troubles with my energy levels. I was drinking a lot of coffee. All these things that I've talked about in my episodes about nutrition. And to finish, even though actually there is more, I had landed into LA basically thinking that moving and living in a sunny place would take care of this big dark cloud that was slowly coming over me. And in LA, I had found all the wellness industry. I kind of had started all that acupuncture, seeing astrologers. I'm just making a big mixed bag of all of it. Some of it is more serious, some of it much less. But basically, let's just say that I had a whole team around me. I had enough money to pay for it and I was feeling desperate enough that I would tell myself the story that it was for my well-being and that it was worth it. I had also slowed down on my career so I was focusing on myself in order it was just look it was just a mess and the funniest thing it was is that it was a mess that looked so beautiful because at the same time I had gotten to LA and made a beautiful house and everything was so outwardly amazing. I was on the cover of a magazine with my house and, and everything that was written about me was fantastic. And I was this creative, I don't know, mogul, whatever people wanted to see in me. And meanwhile, I felt like I was failing inside and I was very scared. I was very scared of something, but I didn't know what. The thing with depression is that you can describe the external things as much as you want. I could tell you all of the same story and at the same time be completely mentally healthy. Some people go through the worst storms of their life and for some reason they make it through even stronger. So all that to say that you don't need to have necessarily external events to happen. It is true that for me it took all of that to really kind of shake me out of my pretty sturdy mental health. But for some people, it can just stem from a lack of sleep, for example, which we'll go back to. It can just stem from deep exhaustion. It can just stem from their genetics. It can be anything. It doesn't need to be the fact that you have a drama in your life or trying to have a baby and not have it or be disappointed in the career that you thought was great. Depression is not always correlated with what's happening externally in your life. What I think is the common denominator is how depression feels. And to me, at least, it's this sense of despondency, this sense of the world being gray. Even if I was in LA and the sun was bright and shining every day and I was trying to kick myself every day to be happy and that's also something to me that always comes back is this idea of waking up with a dark cloud above myself that's shadowing everything that's really a sense of nothing's worth it 
and having to prime myself every morning to convince myself that life is beautiful, that it's worth it, and that you have to keep going. And so there was this vibe, this kind of darkness, and I was waking up and I was like, oh, no, another day. What am I going to do? Where am I going to go? There was this boredom, but not because I was without anything to do. It's just because everything felt sad and empty and dark and blah. And that's how it started. And of course, being me, I tried to fight it with all my might. And I doubled down on the coaches and the sidekicks and the therapist and everything. And unfortunately, I think when you try to force things and never admitting to myself, okay, something is deeply wrong and you have to look into it. I also have to mention something because I think it's an important thing to talk about. Is that fertility treatments load you with so much hormones that it often results in difficulty in mental health. So that's something to be very conscious about, whatever you're going through in your fertility journey, if you have one. And that's one of the reasons why I stopped. I'll, I'll tell you all about that one day. These are such difficult subjects that, oh, I'm just worried that I'm going to make you feel horrible. And that's why I don't like talking about these things. It's not so much I can talk about it. I'm happy now, but I just don't want to depress everyone, right? So the feeling of depression slowly settling in like dust in your life, covering slowly all the walls, is interesting because it's not something you can describe intellectually. It's just a vibe. It's just a sadness. It's just something profoundly... You feel like you want to let go. You feel like you could stay in bed all day. You feel like you don't have any desires. And life is about desires. And suddenly you don't have that anymore. And I fought it. And the problem is that with everything that I described to you earlier, my mental health started suffering. There is a price to pay when you're not super strong, when you're fragile, when you've lost a little bit of your emotional balance. There's a price to pay if you go see psychics and people who tell you that you're special and people that tell you that they can talk to your angels and people who tell you that you were a priestess in your past lives. I'm just telling you some of the most outrageous things, but there is so much more. Or the person who told me that I should write to my unborn child. These things tipped me over. And that's when I lost my mental health. And it reminds me of what I was telling you my first depression. It's when you basically lose touch with reality. That was what happened to me. I started giving in to magical thinking. Thinking that I could manifest the things that I wanted into existence that I could change my relationship with my will and apply power to things that I was actually powerless in, that just weren't working. And at the same time, I had completely lost my sleep, whether it's all the hormones, whether it's my diet, whether it's my state of anxiety that was at incredible high level, I don't know, but my I'm somebody who can wake up really early. Something that I could kind of always like when I wake up at 6.30 before everyone and I can have my coffee and it's all quiet. But when it started being 5.30, 4.30, waking up at 3 a.m. and it's dark outside and you're alone and you start thinking of all these weird things. I remember one of my psychics had told me that I could channel, that I was a psychic myself, which is be careful because that is often what some of them will tell you. And if you're fragile, you might believe it. And I'm not saying it's not true. I'm just saying these are the kind of things that we can only do when we're very healthy, very grounded. And I was trying to channel at three in the morning, trying to talk to the spirits. And 
just went into a very dangerous, crazy place. Because what happened at that moment was when you lose touch with reality, when you think that you can speak with angels, when the lines get blurred between fantasy and reality, then the lines between life and death can be blurred. And if you're in a place that's getting darker and darker every day, whatever you do, it can get to a very dangerous place. And I honestly, it makes me, I feel very responsible about you that's listening when I'm talking about that. But these places are really places that are not nice to go to and that we should avoid if we can. I found myself there alone in the middle of the night and I realized that I was going completely insane, that I had lost touch with reality, that I was really bad and that everything that I was doing was not working, that it was on the contrary taking me to a very bad place. That night, I got scared for my life. What was going to happen if I kept going there? And it is that day that I realized how deeply depressed I was. Something that no one, including me, had seen, but that had been creeping on me for so many years, very slowly, eating up my creativity, eating up my energy, eating up my taste for life, eating up my sleep, eating up everything. And when that happened, it's almost like I had touched the bottom of the pool and I had to give a big push to go back up. Because at that same moment when I felt this intensity of despair, I finally felt my love for myself and my love for life come back up. I would be the one who would save myself this time. There was no mother around, nothing. I was alone and I was going to do it on my own. And that same day, I chose life and I chose happiness and I chose to accept my destiny and to make the best of it. And I called the psychiatrist right away. And I said, please see me today. I'm not doing well. I went to see him. We talked about a lot of things that I'll keep for another episode. Different therapies that I could have gone through. One of them, because remember, we're in LA. And this was a very serious person. Uh, and he, he still is. He's a great psychiatrist. He said, if you hadn't been in such a state, I would probably have tried psilocybin, which is mushrooms therapy for you. And I said, no, I just want the normal stuff. No more wellness, no more spirituality, no more healing. No, I just want the normal stuff. Just give me the stuff that's been working for many years and that you've put your patience on. And so that day I started on antidepressants. He actually gave me the lowest dose. It's a very old antidepressant and one that's supposed to help you sleep. That day, I also entirely stopped anything that wasn't super grounded. I even stopped yoga. I just didn't want to hear anything about spiritual healing, about finding my soul about anything like that. I had taken it so far, way too far. I just wanted a normal doctor and normal meds, and that's all I wanted. The number one thing he said was we were going to work on my sleep and that it was, in his sense, probably what had brought me to the depression and to the place where I was. As I was telling you earlier, all the other things are events of life. Some are really hard. Some are just more pedestrian. Everybody goes through career changes. But what really tipped me over into terrible mental health probably was the fact that I wasn't sleeping anymore. So if you have sleeping issues, 
this is, I think, one of the most important thing to fix in one's life. Number one, number one, always. And then he let me go and I started working with a therapist, which I've talked about in my episode about all the therapies I've done. Uh, therapies would ended up disappointing me. But at that time, as long as it was very down to earth and that I could just cry somewhere, it was helping. And then I kept seeing my psychiatrist, but it was very expensive, so I couldn't do it every week. And that's not the point, but... He was also a very good listener, so I wish I could have seen more of him. I went back to Super Basics, prioritized anything that would put my mental health back on track, trying to sleep as much as I could, running. Running has always been something that's a huge, huge deal for my mental health. In general, exercise, of course, but running is easy. It's right there. And I needed things that were like that. I didn't want to intellectualize anything. And then I threw away all my self-help books, all my manifestation coaches. And I just, it's a little bit like the first time. It's just that suddenly all I wanted was to be better. All my focus was no more on trying to change from inside of my depression, if you will. All those efforts that I had done through seeing healers and psychics and and whatever, this all was seen from the inside of my depression. So it was always bringing me back to this. I felt like, oh, I need to heal this and I need to look into my past for the traumas I've had. And of course, I was encouraged by all these people into doing that, which is fine when you're okay, when you're not mentally unhealthy. I was looking into generational trauma, all these things. So all of what I was doing was, in a way, cultivating the darkness. I wasn't outside of it. Cultivating the lack. I was in that bubble and that cloud of grayness. And in a way, everything that I was doing was from there, keeping me in there. I don't know if I'm explaining this well. It was a self-fulfilling prophecy. You're feeling bad, so you need to work on what's making you feel bad. And then you find the thing that's making you feel bad, which makes you feel more bad. It was just this kind of spiraling into darkness and into trying to change things from a place of unease. It was an impossible task that I had given myself. And the disappointment in myself that I wasn't able to make this fucking work was adding to the darkness. It was terrible. And I think what happened when I decided to kick all of this out was that I pushed myself out of that bubble of sadness and depression. And I don't want to simplify this, but it happened to me twice. And so I can see that sometimes for some people, at least for me, there is a sort of a switch Like, I popped myself out of this and I started working on feeling better from a place where I was outside of my depression. So it was still here, but now I could recognize the things. I could recognize that feeling that was talking to you, that despondency, that grayness, that boredom, that lack of desire, that lack of lust for I could see it from the outside. And... When I felt it coming back to me, when I felt like it was attracting me, because of course, it's like in every movie you've ever seen, the darkness is always calling you and your work is to kind of ignore it and not always think you have to go deep in it to fix it. And when you are outside, you take distance, it becomes smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And this is why I think sometimes self-help can be a bit tricky because In telling people that they have to work on their trauma, this work is really never ending. And sometimes we need a break from it. And that's what I gave myself. I was like, you know what? I'm never going to fix everything. I'm not going to fix transgenerational trauma. I'm not going to fix even just trauma from, you know, my childhood or whatever. And I was also questioning what exactly is trauma? So all these things that had been told that were wrong with me, I started telling myself, this is just part of my life. And what I can do 
Today, to be happy is very simple. Sleep, eat well, go run, and cultivate simple happiness. I know it sounds really boring, but it is. And to go back to the antidepressants, I don't know truly what chemical effects it had on me. What I know, though, is that it reassured me that there was something that I could rely on. And that is enough. I don't need the proof that it works. I just needed something different, this kind of push and this kind of line that I had that I could hold on. It was kind of a little bit of a a cord that, you know, every day I would take it and it would reassure me that I was protected from going back into that cloud of darkness that was still sometimes calling me because there is a weird comfort in depression it's oh my god it's just so difficult to describe and i just don't wish it for anyone so through this lifeline that had been thrown by my psychiatrist i slowly made this bubble of darkness smaller and smaller and smaller i knew what i want to see him that's a very interesting thought, I think. That the day I'd really feel better, I'd be able to break up with that relationship that was not working. I knew that in the middle of the depression was not a moment to do that because I probably would have gone back and it would have created more drama and more codependency and all these things. And I remember, oh, it should be an, a whole... This... Okay, this moment that I'm not going to tell you about today will be a whole episode because I remember the day where I told myself, okay, this is it, I'm I'm breaking up. And I knew that this relationship could only work if I was depressed. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that crazy? And I knew I could only serve that relationship on the condition that I was completely down. And the second that I started feeling better, I just left it. And it was very, very, very easy. One day, it took a few years and I didn't want to necessarily stop the antidepressants. But at some point, I felt like I could protect myself. The cloud of darkness was so far. I had found my sleep back. I had become very protective very protective of my mental health and I thought this might be the moment to get back to a life without medication. I think it took about three years. I've talked about that in in my newsletters by the way if you're interested. I've talked about the antidepressants, I've talked about the depression and I've also talked about leaving that relationship and I also knew that I didn't want to spend all my life on medication. I wanted to see if I could find myself as happy and balanced as I was without it. And so that's what I did. I slowly tapered up. That's how, I think that's how you call it. You go really slowly. You don't stop one day to the next. And I think for me, it was slowly saying goodbye to something that had really helped me. I never had any negative feelings as much as I try to stay away from unnecessary medicine. With the antidepressant, I had a very good relationship. There was this kind of crutch. I was fine with having it. It wasn't making me feel like a loser to take it. It was making me feel like I was strong enough to know that I needed help. And that at the moment when I wouldn't need it anymore, it was like a a helper to whom I could say, okay, thank you, we've had a great time together and I know you'll always be here for me if I need you. But for now, I think I'm going to try to walk on my own two legs. And that's what I did. And I've been antidepressant free for a few years now. And there is so much to learn from this episode of my life. The simplest things can protect us from being unhealthy mentally, sleeping, staying away from screens, trying to protect ourselves from people who are trying to, um, maybe they're trying to help, 
but be careful with all the healers and all that. It's not that they don't want to help. It's just that they're not as they're not as qualified as we think often. And if you're fragile, you might take everything they say way too seriously. I also learned that there is no shame, and I learned to be so much more compassionate with people who have mental health issues. Definitely, because I realized it can really happen to anyone and to be very soft with them. I've learned that I'm neither extremely strong nor extremely fragile. I'm just a human going through a human experience. I have a body that has needs and I need to take care of myself. And that's my number one responsibility in this world is simply to make sure that I'm healthy. That nothing works if you don't have mental health. Nothing. And that's taught me to be a little more selfish, even though it's still something that I'm working on. I've learned so many things about myself, but I don't wish it to any one of you. And I don't even wish it on my past self. But life is made of highs and lows and of moments of darkness and of pure light. And if we can navigate these and find trust and find ourselves surrounded, and if we can navigate these with a little bit of wisdom, and if I helped you today, then I guess this served its purpose. I think you understand now why it is difficult to me to talk about these things. And at the same time, I'm so glad that you feel like you can ask me the tough questions. Let me know if there are things that I went over too fast or if you'd like more details on one thing or another. I'm sending you a lot of love, a lot of health, mental and physical and emotional. And I'll talk to you next week. Le rendez-vous is brought to you by Doré. Doré's latest launch, La Micellaire, is a botanical micellar cleansing water that doesn't require rinsing. Minimize bathroom time and maximize outdoor time with our super simple routine. Use code PODCAST10 for 10% of your first order. Thank you for listening to Le Rendez-vous. If you want to know more about me, find out about my newsletter and my community. Find me on Instagram at Garance Doré or at my website at garance.world. And well, if you'd like to find out how to spell that crazy name, just check out the show notes. Until next time, sending you love.